that. That was the plan. Um, it's a kind of Jewish Disneyland um, that it's being referred to. We also know that um, the Israeli antiquities authorities have destroyed several ancient art, um, archaeological sites and, and, and antiquities um, as a result of this dig, including a cemetery dating back to the Abbasid Caliphate um, and relics dating back to the Canaanite era um, in the second era millennium um, in the second BC uh, millennium BC. Sorry. Um, and and these digs are not for a love of history or archaeology. In fact, Israel routine, routinely destroys ancient cities that are unearthed by archaeologists, um, so long as they have nothing to do with Jewish history. And there's a lot of those. Um, the, the first thing, um, as a matter of fact, that Israel did, literally the, um, the, the, the next day after they conquered Jerusalem in 1967, was to demolish an 800, the entire 800-year-old Moroccan quarter in Jerusalem um, that displaced hundreds of Palestinians. Um, Israel has engaged in this massive destruction of antiquities uh, in a very consistent, <coughs> uh, a very consistent and systematic uh, way. Um, another uh, example is a recent find of a 1,200-year-old mixed village of well-off um, Christians and Muslims who lived together. Um, as a matter of fact, archaeologists didn't even get a chance um, to, uh, to do much. All, all they could do was uh, take some photos and record as, much of the of, as many of the relics as they could um, before bulldozers came in uh, to demolish the site for development of some kind of uh, industrial park. And again, <laughs> these are all just surveys of the surface um, uh, of, of a tremendous amount of, of hidden realities. Um, the depredations of Israel are much more vast, they are deeper and far more reaching. Um, but my hope is that what I presented here will at least help expand the view of Israel uh, from an apartheid nation that's suppressing the indigenous population to a deeper understanding of Israel as a global force of violence, plunder, paranoia, surveillance, greed, war, suppression, ecological destruction, erasure of history, the forceful transfer of wealth from the weak to the powerful, and the entrenchment of supremacist ideologies that set human hierarchies and castes. No matter how many gay pride marches they hold or how many Eurovisions they host, no matter how good their national orchestra touring the world makes you feel, or how the Palestinian citizens given a symbolic vote, um, or no matter how much greenwashing or pinkwashing or whitewashing propaganda there is in the mainstream media, the way that Israel exists in the world is ultimately antithetical to life. It is antithetical to liberty, not just for Palestinians, but for every people that struggles against tyranny, oppression, and ecological destruction. Um, the, the, the situation is quite dire, um, but, I, but I, I, I want to uh, end on a, a little bit of hope. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of movement here in the world, in, in the United States, and I think in the world, um, where the masses are, uh, are, are really making their voices heard. Um, there, are, there is tremendous solidarity from various um, uh, oppressed communities, both within the United States, like Black Lives Matter and indigenous movements. Um, and, of course, there is the tireless... Uh, resistance of Palestinians themselves, um, and uh, and these are just uh, these are just some images, uh, recent images from the uh, uh, from the rebellions happening in the United States and around the world, and the connections that are being made by activists, um, which have a long tradition of reciprocal solidarity around the world. So, um, thank you very much. I think I may have go gone a little bit over time. Um, but uh, uh, thank you for listening to me. And I apologize again for my dogs, uh, for their intrusion. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan.
for uh, inspiring uh, and, and lecture. Uh, yes, we are a bit uh, over time uh, and uh, I think there are uh, several uh, questions from, uh, from the audience. I uh, don't want to, to, to waste uh, this uh, uh, occasion. I would uh, like to ask you something, but I would start uh, leaving the floor, uh, Clara, if you have uh, uh, questions from, um, from the participant, from the chat. Uh, so I would start from this side of the, the participants. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Suzanne, also from my side. And uh, um, I'm going to give the word to Asnan Shabir, who has a question for, for you. So please. Okay. Lara, there is, the, there is a question from the president in the chat. Maybe you would like to take it? Yeah. Let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't hear anything from Adnan, uh, but I see here from Roland. To me, it's hard to understand how a people who has experienced oppression and murder during centuries. Um, I'm sorry, Susanna. I'm sorry, Susanna. Adnan Shabir was. Uh, okay. Yes. He's, he's connected evening. now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Hussain Shabir from Azad Kashmir, Pakistan. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, that, that was a very good session from uh, uh, Suzanne's side. Uh, so my question is, uh, Israel became the member of UNO uh, during the 1949, if I'm not wrong. Uh, the purpose of UNO was to establish uh, international peace and disarmament. And if we can observe the ongoing uh, situation of the world, and uh, the situation of, and we can compare it with UNO's objectives or purposes. Uh, don't you think that UNO is not taking the stand on the principles that were set right after World War II? This is my question. Um, thank you for that question. It's, it's, um, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, the, terms of, the terms of Israel's acceptance to the UN, um, were that, and they also, the other important terms um, for their acceptance was their acceptance of UN Resolution 194. And uh, 194 stipulated the return of the indigenous population that had been recently made refugees, the Palestinians. Um, so, uh, you know, given that Israel has not actually fulfilled its the the terms of its acceptance to the UN um, there really is complete grounds and legal basis for them to be expelled from the UN and I think they should be but unfortunately the United Nations has really not had uh, has has just really kind of given just a lot of talk and has had no no real teeth and no no real enforcement of of their own resolutions um, and, uh, and by the way, you know, I'm sure you know this, um, being from Pakistan, that Israel has also s supplied India extensively with weapons um, that are used in Kashmir, uh, at, you know, now. Exactly. Sorry if, if I'm interrupting you. Basically, I am from Kashmir. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm living uh, uh, right, right behind the line of control. That is called LOC, line of control. And we, the people of Kashmir, are suffering. Uh, my grandfather, paternal, and my maternal grandfather, they came, they migrated from Indian, of, from, from Indian Kashmir to here in Pakistan in 1947, at the time of partition, for the peace. But you know what actually is going on right now? At here in uh, Azad Kashmir, that is under Pakistani administration, in Azad Kashmir line of control and in Indian occupied Kashmir, the situation is same. India is targeting the people of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir at line of control on a daily basis. I yeah. have interviewed so many people. And, and but one, one more point I would like to mention at here. Uh, since long, I tried to mention all, uh, all the things with evidence to Antonio Guterres, that, that he is the general, secretary general of UNO on Twitter. Please kindly, uh, just one time, raise this issue of Kashmir because you are the head of most 
world's largest peace organization so being a kashmiri i hmm. so it sounds like we lost audio yep please yep. i i would like to leave a uh, room also to to other uh, questions uh, as there are uh, in in the chat and and from the participants so um clara would you like to last question if 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 you can hear me my last question is according to the ground reality this is my question for the rest of the world uno should be mandated or ended this is my question because you know is not following their objectives aim mm -hmm. that were settled right after the world war 2 big attention uh, this is my question yeah i mean i i i honestly i don't feel qualified to to answer that and um and i uh, but i you know personally i you know uh i do see uh I don't think I I personally don't feel that the UN should necessarily be disbanded. The UN is really a problem. Um <clears throat> but it has also given rise to um to organ to to UN affiliated organizations like UNESCO for example that I think has been um hugely important especially you know for Palestinians and and uh you know for the preservation um and a lot of organizations that work for the preservation of non-human life. which you know i think as humans we 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 never really acknowledge and and don't pay much attention to um but that's something that i i i am deeply involved with and i and i care deeply about um uh, animals and wildlife and and our ecology and and the world that we live in and the rights of of non-human life to live uh, unmolested by us so the un does does serve um important functions in in arenas um even at the same time that they contribute to some of the problems that people like you and I have and i do appreciate you bringing up kashmir and i want to acknowledge your passion and the pain and and the desire to to get a, to get a few words in there because because there's not enough attention on kashmir and what has been happening there and um and it 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 is a travesty and it's and it's an abomination what the world is allowing to happen in Kashmir. So, um solidarity my brother, I hear you um and I acknowledge that for sure. Thank, Thank you so I, much. Dara, please. There Can are... you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, please. So, please President President Sander. Yeah. Yeah, thank you Susan for this uh, wealth of information I was not aware of. And thank you also for your comment on Kashmir. Uh, if you read Arundhati Roy, yeah, you get also an impression what's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. And I agree hundred percent with your notion that we should be responsible also for non-human lives. Uh, yeah, I have a, a very simple question. To me, it has always been so hard to understand how a people that has suffered so much during history has now become a murderer and suppressor. itself and therefore my question is very simple is there a way out or do is the best uh, vision we we may have still leave everything as it is um so uh definitely not leave things as they are because things as they are are um uh, will, will will probably lead to our extinction <laughs> um which may not be a bad thing for the planet who knows but um look i think sometimes there is this um sort of disbelief about how can jews do this right because we have this we we have been taught endlessly that um jews are the ultimate victims of you know around the world um first of all that is not entirely true because it is definitely true of european history but that is not true of muslim history um or of the middle east in general where where jews and jewish communities have lived and thrived for millennia from uh from from baghdad to I iran morocco i mean there are ancient ancient jewish communities that had lived there prior to the establishment of israel so that's one thing 
Um, but you are right that it was it was the people who suffered under European anti-Semitism and and oppression and suppression who ultimately founded Zionism and and became the colonizers. Um, and again, you know, this isn't. I mean, on an individual level, like as individuals, we know that people who are abused oftentimes become come the, become the biggest abusers as individuals. Um, and I think that it seems that the same principle applies uh, in, in the collective. Um, and uh, sorry, I don't know what's happening on my screen. But anyway, um, uh, you know, for example, you know, Liberia was was established by um, formerly enslaved Americans um, who who uh, were sort of sent back to Africa, quote unquote, and and ended up becoming uh, enslaving local community, local uh, population themselves. But we have to. But, but the thing is that I think we have to look. Be, we have to sort of not hold on to these sort of mythologies that victims can't possibly do something number one um and they can't possibly be be victimizers and and edward said really wrote this wonderful essay in which he addressed this very issue that you're talking about and he talked about how the world has such a problem comprehending this because we are victims of the victims and um, and that's true, and it, and I hear that echo in your question, this disbelief uh, of, that they could actually do that. In fact, and I'll point this out, and this may be another bit of information that you that you didn't know. In two thousand and eleven or two thousand twelve, I believe it was, there were there was a group of Jewish um, uh, lawyers and and Holocaust uh, reparations organizations who petitioned the um, Red Cross to open their archives that were sealed. Um, and the purpose was, was to uh, further reparations claims in European courts and in American courts. And when they did that, when the, 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 the Red Cross did open its archives, um, some, what, there were, a lot of things were revealed. Among them was the fact that... Um, Israel had at least, I believe it was 13 concentration camps in Palestine. They were forced labor camps in which Palestinian, uh, Palestinians were uh, how, warehoused um, and uh, forced, to, forced to work for Israelis, um, especially when they were plundering and looting Palestinian homes in the early days of, uh, of the establishment of Israel. And these concentration camps, these forced labor camps, were actually manned by some of the uh, some of the, the 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 European Jews who had been freed from concentration camps themselves. So yes, it happens. It happens on an individual level, and it happens on a national level, on a collective level. And um, and but that should not be our point. That is not the point. The point is that um, as human beings, we are capable of. Of, of, of great good and great evil, uh, regardless of who we are. And, 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 and we have to let go of these notions that um, any group of people is an eternal victim or an eternal villain and whatnot. Um, so, so I think, you know, that's a place to start. Israel's violations of, of international law, their, their human rights violations, their, their terrorism, the state terror, the colonialism, the destruction of, of, of life and history and heritage is well documented. It is, it is there for everyone to see. And, you know, uh, uh, nobody, well, nobody wants to do anything about it. And interestingly, the only time anyone wants anybody, you know, moves a finger is when Palestinians act, is when we, and, and usually when we act in a spectacular way with violence. That is when the world is like, oh, we have to do something. But in the meantime, Palestinians are killed on a daily basis, humiliated, robbed, terrorized on a daily basis. And, and that's kind of the norm. But what hits the news cycles is when Palestinians retaliate or, or resist in some way. Um, so, I mean, and that's a problem. So, thank you. 
the way out, I was asking for the way out, if there is any. I'm sorry, just, okay. So, thank you. And uh, then I give the word to Cristina Della Torre. Please, Cristina. Yeah, good afternoon also from my side. Thank you uh, for the touching presentation, Mrs. Ablawa. My question is actually related to uh, Mrs. Mr. Sander one. And what I wanted to ask you is whether actually there are counter movements uh, within Israeli population or uh, Jewish population, like the examples you made of the US Jewish for Peace. Um, and these movements um, could be maybe the seed to stop Israel states and enterprises violence um, and start change from within. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is this actually ties well into Roland's last question is what is the way out? Um, look, the we have we have a. Uh, we have a system, we have conventions, we have uh, the infrastructure to deal with uh, the kind of imperialism, colonization that Israel is engaged in. But there has been no political will. So, you know, there's the ICC, there's the UN, there's, there's all, there's, there, there are sanctions, there's all manner of tools that have been employed mostly against African nations or Middle Eastern nations and, and you know, darker nations rather. Um, but nothing, but no one, there's no political will at the level of the leaders to do anything when it comes to Israel. So, but, but they should, they should do that. But we are left with the fact that it's not happening. So because of that, Palestinians themselves have launched um, the boycott and divestment and sanctions campaign. And that is a tool of resistance that the whole world can engage in. Um, citizens, normal, just ordinary people everywhere can engage uh, uh, in this nonviolent popular mode of resistance where people can, can express solidarity with the oppressed when the leaders, when world leaders are failing to act and they're failing abysmally. So, um, so, so, so for starters, number one, just, you know, to, to, to summarize that answer, we have the infrastructure and, and we need to push leaders to utilize that infrastructure. Um, concurrently, uh, people should follow Palis the Palestinian lead on, on their own liberation agenda. And Palestinians have chosen uh, a, a boycott campaign similar to what brought apartheid South Africa to its knees. Um, that is something anyone can engage in. Um, and, uh, and, and when, you know, there's also a cultural boycott aspect of that, and it is to engage in uh, uh, lobbying artists and, and, and scientists and businesses not to engage with Israel. I mean, this is the only thing we have left. To you know, it, and that is the the solidarity and goodwill of people around the world. So there's that. Now, to your quest, to your comment, um, Christina, regarding movements within Israel. Um, so I think that's fine, you know. But but I don't. I think it's uh, 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 it's unfair to um, expect Palestinians to wait for um, uh, Israelis to have a conscience and and do the right thing. And we know historically that that doesn't happen. Um, uh, except within small, uh, uh, marginalized groups. And the groups you're talking about actually are very small and they're very marginalized and they're considered outcasts within Israel. Um, and uh, including, for example, there, there's a group of young people, they're called refuseniks, who refuse to, uh, uh, to serve in the Israeli military, um, as they have said to... Um, uh, they refuse to oppress, uh, starve, etc. Uh, Palestinians. Um, there's a group called Breaking the Silence. This is a group of Israelis who are former Israeli soldiers who themselves had participated in um, terrorism against Palestinians uh, uh, in, in human rights violations. And after years, their conscience has um, 
uh, propelled them to, to speak about what they have done and what they have seen others do. And the stories are horrific, actually. Um, I would encourage you to, to get a glimpse of what the daily realities are like for Palestinians by reading testimonies from the soldiers themselves who were engaged in um, uh, you know, a, a contest to, to, to see who can shoot the most Palestinian knees and things like that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and there are a few noteworthy personalities, some journalists like Amira Haas and Gideon Levy, who do write about um, the realities on the ground. But the, that sector of Israeli society is so small. Um, and, and, uh, and, and they are actually quite insignificant within Israel. The vast majority, I think it was something like 94% of Israelis during 2014 supported um, what essentially was, a, like, according to the questions, was basically carpet bombing Gaza. So I don't really, um, I, don't, I don't hold uh, a lot of faith in that. Um, in the same way in the United States, you know, the white people in this country don't move to act on their conscience just because they're, they're, they're troubled by um, pangs of their conscience. They are moved to act because black people in this country rebel because they rise up um, and that's what's happening. And, and I, I would never think that I'm going to wait for, for white people in this country to fix racism, but rather, you know, as a Palestinian, as a woman, as a human, I, I follow the lead of uh, of black people and black organizations in this country to tell me what I need to do to be, to stand in solidarity. It is, you know, it's a resistance we wage alongside them under their leadership of how, uh, how their liberation should be conducted, not how white America needs it to be conducted. And the same applies for, for Palestine and Israel. Israel is an oppressor. They are a colonial state. They came with all the racism, all the, 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 the degradation of, of brown people that existed in Europe at the time, and they applied it to Palestine. It's that simple. And, and, um, and that really needs to, needs to really break through the perceptions that people have about Israel um, being this sort of miracle refuge and savior and whatnot. Thank you again, please, Francesco Palermo. Oh, well, thank you. Um, very brief, I just uh, wrote it on the uh, chat. Um, uh, I was wondering about your um, opinion uh, on the situation uh, that is now uh, unfolding after the new uh, cabinet that has been formed in Israel, whether you think that it might give some uh, sign of hope uh, to, you know, reverse or at least to uh, ease a little bit the uh, policy of the Netanyahu uh, government so far, uh, or whether the fact that the uh, United Arab List uh, is now marginalized in uh, the Knesset uh, will um, actually yeah, make the government continue along the same line. Thank you. So the short answer is no. Um, and Clara is telling me I need to, to give shorter answers. Um, uh, regardless of who's in power in Israel, the basic, um, the basic premise and the basic strategies Israel has employed from the, since its inception has not changed. It has always been about colonizing Palestine, taking maximum land um, with minimum ind indigenous Palestinians. And that has not changed and it will not change. Whether or not Israel annexes um, the Jordan Valley now or next year, we know it's in their plans and they're going to, they're going to implement it one way or another. Um, this has always been the plan. There was never, uh, 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 you know, I think the whole world, including Palestinians, were fooled with Oslo, thinking that um, uh, this was going to be a genuine peace. But as the world knows now, it was really just a way to quell the first intifada and 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 buy Israel more time to continue colonizing 
under the guise of, of negotiations. So, um, and, and much of that occurred under a labor, uh, uh, under labor governments. So whether it's the Likud, labor, the, the home front, um, ra rather the home party, it, it, you know, the, the policies don't change. It's just that it's just, it's the same way that, you know, in the United States, we had this, this, this beautiful, brilliant African-American president. Um, but all he did was put a black face to bombing um, Pakistan, to drone killing, to more war, uh, to more corporate, corporate uh, tax breaks and, 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 uh, uh, and, and suppression. So um, that's what, you know, that's what happens in Israel. So that, you know, you, you get a few labor leaders and, and everybody sort of thinks, oh, this is going to be better. And maybe Palestinians get, you know, get one of the apartheid roads paved instead of having to, to drive on potholes. And that's the extent of it. So no, it does not make a difference. Ultimately, but the only thing that's going to make a difference is international action to isolate Israel one way or another, whether that's done at the leadership level, or at the level of um, or at the level of the, of the people around the world isolating Israel. That's, to me, that's the only thing that, that can uh, affect any change. That is the only way um, change was really able to, to uh, be affected in other places as well. So this is a, you know, we, we know this from history. Thank you. Glenda, please. Glenda? Okay, so let's go on. Andrea, maybe? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Clara. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, in, in your words, uh, um, you, you, you describe um, a strategy of uh, creation of uh, refugees uh, in Palestine by Israel. So it's, it's clear that uh, in, in, uh, in your opinion, there is uh, this, uh, this strategy, this uh, appropriation of resources, uh, this expulsion of people and, and so on, as part of uh, um, even an ideology in this sense. So I am wondering if uh, talking about the role of uh, Israel um, worldwide uh, in the market of weapons and all uh, all of the issues uh, uh, discussed in your in your talk uh, in your speech, uh, do you see any kind of uh, global strategy in this sense? So I mean, the creation of refugees is part of a, of a global strategy of securitization, of exclusion, of appropriation of resources. In your opinion, and is Israel having a a, a, a guiding role, an important role within this strategy? Um, I think Israel plays a tremendous role. And, uh, and of course, they're not the only ones, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to say that the whole, all the world's ills are, should be placed on Israel's shoulders. Um, but Israel does play uh, a very important role, if not directly, often as a conduit. Um, so for example, you know, when, when the United States wants to perpetuate some kind of war, or whatever, but we can't, you know, we have uh, maybe congressional stops or something to that, you know, they, they go to Israel and Israel conducts, you know, sometimes this um, subterfuge that the U.S. or other nations can't get away with on the international scene. Um, I think, like, so much of, so much of, of, of the refugee crises, it's not just one, um, and in the things driving it, whether it's war, whether it's political suppression, whether it's environmental disasters um, uh, and climate change, um, so so much of 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 these um, underlying issues are interwoven together, and they are all tied in some way to capitalism and to to patriarchy and this. Um, and notions of supremacy. Um, so all of these things go hand in hand, capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, you know, misogyny. Um, sometimes they're not even, they're, sometimes they're not even, uh, uh, they're inseparable, basically. 
Um, I, I think, and this is something that underlies a lot of the demands by young people today, which is sort of this implement, which is basically an eradication of, of re- capitalism as this rapacious, endlessly consuming system that invites this kind of uh, accumulation of wealth that, that remains unchecked. And it invites the exploitation and the destruction of other peoples and other societies to steal their resources. I mean, if you look at the war, you know, the destruction of Iraq and everything that has ensued in the Middle East since then. I mean, it was it was driven by and to a large part by capitalist interests and in, and in, in stealing other people's resources. So I think I think really as societies, we really have to begin to imagine a world beyond capitalism. Um, and I think young people today are, are doing exactly that. I think at least here in the United States, um, where, where a huge portion of the country doesn't have access to healthcare in a pandemic, you know, a lot of these things are driving the current rebellions. Um, I don't know if it'll happen in, in, you know, in my lifetime, but I do see the seeds of change. You know, you see it with, uh, with the global youth movement against climate change that, you know, of which uh, Greta Thunberg has been the face of, but which she's not alone. You know, there's a lot of young people, um, uh, uh, indigenous youth and, and African youth who have been doing this for a lot longer than she has. But nonetheless, you know, she's, she's a wonderful example of, of the ways that young people are, um, are engaging and taking charge of their own future. So, you know, I, I derive a lot of hope from that. Um, and I do think that, you know, again, leading, following the lead of people who are most impacted by our actions is, is, is a good, um, is a good rule of thumb to follow. But I do feel that so much of, um, of our world and the ills can can be they all rest on these notions of of supremacy and capitalism okay so we have time for one more question and it's uh, from glenda hello good evening mom good evening from the philippines hi i don't know if this is a question but uh, considering the nature of your job as a novel writer, you're disclosing what are the realities on the ground through your novel. Have you received any criticisms or threats in your life as a writer? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I have. Um, I think any, I mean, yeah, many times. Even before I became a writer, when I, when I was... Uh, before I became a novelist, when I was writing mostly political essays, um, or yeah, I mean, I think any, you know, you, 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 um, the worst was one time when uh, uh, my daughter was actually threatened, and she was a she was a small child, and and I actually had to call the authorities for that. Um, but yes, and actually, all of my friends who are activists, I don't really know a single one who hasn't been threatened in one way. Um, we've all been called anti semites. We've all been um, harassed as such. Um, but you know, that's, um, there's kind of a joke in our community that, um, you, you made it when, when they target you <laughs> like, Oh, it means you're, you're important that you're doing something good. Um, uh, and I, I don't mean to make light of it. I don't mean to make a joke of it, but this is our reality. And, but it's, but it's actually a small, a very small thing compared to what, um, our families and our loved ones and our friends go through in Palestine. So um, I do see that there are other questions in the chat. I don't know, Clara, if you. Yes. Yes. Those. There's Samantha for the last, for the last question. So please, Samantha. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for uh, your lecture. It was extremely interesting and extremely informative. My question is, how do you explain the fact that Jewish intellectuals um, of Israeli and non-Israeli origin, like Moshe Zuckerman, Ilan Pape, Mikko Pellet, Evelyn Hechkalinsky, Gideon Levy, Moni Ovadia, Shlomo Sand, and exponent of the 
ex-soldiers from the movement Breaking the Silence, just to mention a few of them, who have a critical position on Israeli politics, practically never get interviewed in European mainstream media. And do they get space in US and mainstream media? No. No, they do not. Um, and uh, I'm actually uh, friends with most of the people on that list. Um, and, you know, as you know, for example, Ilan Pape left uh, um, Israel and he, he lives in, in the UK and teaches at Oxford because he was basically hounded by, uh, um, by Israelis and his life was threatened. Um, Miko Pellet also lives in the US and he, even though he's, he comes, you know, he's the son of uh, one of the founders, one of Israeli generals, um, he, uh, he has been hounded there as well and marginalized. In general, these voices are, they're marginalized within Israeli society and they're given no airtime here in the US and um, apparently clearly not in Europe. Um, which really should make people think, you know, why is that? What, why doesn't our media, because, you know, we hear in the U.S. people have this perception of us having a free media and, and whatnot, which, again, is a lie. It's, it's very much corporatized and it very much answers to big money and big donors and, and, uh, and, and whatnot. So. Okay, Clara. It seems that we, we are running out of time. So um, I, would like, uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Susan, for this uh, precious occasion of uh, uh, discussion, interaction, presentation. Of course, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's very uh, challenging. It's very difficult now coming back and, 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 and discussing these issues uh, with uh, optimism. But I, I do believe that we must be optimistic, uh, and uh, as you were uh, saying, uh, these new movements uh, also in these days, the U.S. Uh, are, are teaching something us uh, also about uh, the new crisis uh, uh, related to COVID-19 and all these new forms of segregation and uh, and uh, um, and ghettoization of people. So I I think that this was a really uh, a good occasion of. Uh, of confrontation. I, I would like to uh, thank especially the Winter School of Federalism uh, with the Francesco Palermo and Greta Kotz because uh, this uh, event was uh, uh, thought and was organized in the beginning within uh, uh, the School of Federalism uh, uh, in February. So really, I would like to thank uh, this uh, uh, institution. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, local communities of South Tyrol, Comunità Comprensoriali, Alto Adige, because they, they were involved uh, in, the, in the preparation of these events. So I think that uh, I can, I can uh, uh, leave you uh, the stage, Susan, for uh, uh, last uh, words here. And, uh, and then uh, I would like to thank everyone once again. Yes, uh, thank you um, hugely. I am very grateful for everyone in attendance, everyone who made this uh, lecture happen finally. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and especially you, Andrea and Clara, um, uh, Yurak, everyone, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to everyone. Hoping to see you and to meet you in person finally in, in Italy and in South Tyrol in the future. So thank you to everyone for participating to this uh, conference, uh, to our president uh, for being with us uh, till the end of the lecture and hoping to see you soon all together. Thank you and good evening. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.
beh, qui c'è resistenza, non ci vogliono lasciare. Li sto, li sto mh, facendo uscire io adesso manualmente. No, scusate che Susan mi sta chiamando sulla... Sì. Eh, ecco. Stefan, ancora Stefan Vizio, vedo, e Alexa. Sì, ecco. Grazie Alexa e grazie Stefan per il supporto. Grazie a tutti, è stato sì, è interessantissimo anche... Sì, se alla fine non, non ci sono tante speranze per me, no? Io non so come, come trovare una soluzione, perché io sono sempre disposto a qualche soluzione, ma al momento, dopo questa lezione di Susan, avrei difficoltà a individuare una soluzione per Israele e Palestina. No, decisamente. Decisamente, purtroppo è stato tutto troppo compromesso negli anni e, e ad oggi la situazione è ancora più drammatica, come spiegava appunto Susan, anche tra le varie interazioni governative a livello globale per cui ci troviamo in una, in una situazione ingestibile da un punto di vista geopolitico al momento purtroppo sì, beh, comunque cerchiamo di restare ottimisti ottimisti certo <ride> grazie mille e ha funzionato tutto Clara? sì ha funzionato tutto ha funzionato meno tutto male, meno male ce l'abbiamo fatta coraggio bene allora io esco e mi dedico all'altro la power non po si... Di Susan si, si può avere sì o... certo naturalmente certo certo si può avere mm -hmm. si bene, può avere tutti. certo e ciao, ciao Stefan grazie ciao e a presto Pietro Stefan tschüss ciao ok sì, sicuramente si può avere, noi la, noi la abbiamo, quindi Bene. la condivido e poi soprattutto trattandoci una, di, di una conferenza nell'ambito di un progetto, ogni tanto abbiamo registrato. Sì, 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 ho visto. Bene. Asnine?